went to account of an activity by both the institutions. And I'm really, really happy to say with you that we have received a really good response for this particular STP. And prior to that, also we organized a I mean, couple of STPs. Uh, so the response here is uh, more than 150, 140, 130 around. And so this is the number of participants. They are regularly available to us, uh, joining us. And uh, uh, yeah, maybe there's some bandwidth issues. So uh, I think I am still audible to you, madam. Yes, yes, you are. Okay, okay. So uh, this is how I mean this STP is being organized. So without taking much time, I'll uh, you know uh, uh, I just say uh, that I welcome you, Dr. Uh, Madhavi, and the participants. And uh, may I request all the participants to please see that the mic is in the mute position. I'll uh, invite uh, Dr. Jakhar, the Techie coordinator at this Bikarnet, right away to uh, formally welcome the honourable speaker and all the participants. And Dr. Jakhar, please. Thank you. Thank you, uh, sir. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning, uh, Dr. Madhvi. Uh, I feel immense pleasure to welcome and introduce uh, Professor Madhvi as, as an eminent speaker in this session. Uh, it's my privilege to introduce uh, Professor Madhvi Lata, is a professor of uh, civil engineering at uh, Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. He uh, did his PhD in civil engineering from IIT Madras, MTech from NIT Warangal, and a bachelor degree in civil engineering from JNTU uh, Kakinada. Before coming to IIC uh, Madhvi, he uh, has worked in assistant professor as IIT uh, Guwahati for a year of 2003 to 2004. He worked as a postdoctorate research at IIC from 2002 to 2003. Madhvi research interest uh, center around fundamental aspects of soil and ground uh, reinforcement. This has um, entailed a study basic frictional characteristics between solids, soils and uh, reinforcement, understanding the strength of improved ground and shear mechanism at micro level. Madhvi's recent work on uh, this subject area is to use image-based techniques to understand the micro topographical surface changes in geo uh, synthesis seared by sands and uh, relating them to stress displacement uh, response of sand geosynthesis uh, interfaces. Several topics explored in the area of soil reinforcement include strength and stiffness of uh, geo cells, reinforced soils, model testing. on geosynthetic reinforcement foundation beds, uh, retaining walls and uh, slopes, cyclic load responses of geosynthetic reinforcement load uh, aggregates, ses seismic response of rigid wrap faced modular block faced and geocell uh, retaining walls through shaking tables studies. So Madhvi also maintain an active interest in many topics in rock engineering, including numerical modeling of joint, jointed rock masses, stability analysis of rock slopes, and rock slope reinforcement. So thank you, uh, Dr. Madhvi, for accepting our invitation. And I formally welcome as a speaker for this session. And I also welcome all the participants uh, for this session, and I hope his uh, lecture will be very fruitful, beneficial for the particip participant. Thank you. Thank you so much. Over to Professor Satan for further proceeding. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Jakhat, for uh, formally extending a warm welcome to the honorable speaker and to all the participants. So, thank you so very much. And uh, yes, uh, you know, uh, I can say that Dr. Madhvi is, uh, you know, uh, person and the faculty who is having very outstanding accomplishments. So that way we are really very privileged to have her you know, take this session for you all. So with that note, I extend a welcome to Dr. Madhvi once again, and I welcome all the participants. And over to you, Professor Madhvi, for your session. You may now start your session, please. Thank you, Professor Satanj and Professor Jakar for uh, giving a nice introduction. I mean, it's a pretty long introduction, I should say. I'm overwhelmed. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, it's my pleasure, indeed, to be associated with NIT Kurukshetra in this manner. 
I never had any formal interactions with uh, your institute. It's my first step. I request the organizers to kindly mute the chat if possible because it's like uh, disturbing me uh, every time. So if you can kindly mute the chat until the end of the thing so that I can take the questions at the end. So I will try to share my screen. I will. One second, just give me one second. Uh, can you see me? Uh, I mean, see the screen? Can someone yeah, come? Yeah, we can, yeah. See, yeah, we can yes. see the screen. Yeah. It's clearly yeah. okay. Okay. Thank you. So, my topic for today's webinar is uh, Geosynthetics for Sustainable Constructions. I've been working in this area of geosynthetics for past 25 years since I joined for my PhD at uh, IIT Madras. Uh, before that, also, I have uh, done a lot of experiments on geosynthetics during my BTEC and MTEC. It's been one of my uh, potential topics of interest in the area of geotechnical engineering. I hope uh, I would be able to convey some of the uh, important aspects of geosynthetics, which are extremely used for uh, constructing sustainable structures. Let me start uh, with the outline of the presentation. Uh, I will be briefly introducing geosynthetics, then uh, talk about the types of geosynthetics. In fact, there are millions of geosynthetics available worldwide. We will not even know that they are geosynthetics. We'll be using them in our day-to-day -day life without knowing that they are actually geosynthetics. So I will be only covering major types of geosynthetics, which are useful for civil engineering constructions and uh, talk about their functions and applications. I will also uh, share some of the interesting case studies worldwide on the use of geosynthetics. And then finally, some of the failures and the lessons learned from failures to conclude with. Let me start with this uh, very interesting and very popular case study of uh, Palm Island, Dubai. It is the uh, world's largest artificial island uh, in Dubai. So if you can see the structure, it is actually built inside uh, the sea and uh, it has a palm tree shape of a uh, uh, structure, um, original uh, main uh, palm tree type of uh, land. And then uh, there is a crescent all around. Uh, if you see, this is uh, one of the civil engineering wonders of present day, how man can reclaim uh, land uh, inside ocean and build and expand the horizons. So what is the role of geosynthetics in this project? Geosynthetics here are used for um, creating uh, breakwaters because this is an island which is inside the sea. So there's always the danger of uh, floods, waves coming and hitting the structures and there could be uh, rays in the seawater level which might affect uh, the habitats uh, which are built. Uh, these are a huge number of constructions inside this island. Uh, if you have ever visited this place, it is one of the must see for civil engineers. So uh, the entire uh, crescent shaped uh, outer layer of this palm island uh, is built with geosynthetic tubes. These uh, protect the entire island from uh, the waves and uh, wind kind of erosion and all other types of uh, um, threats due to water and flood. So this is one of the important case studies I would consider for geosynthetic applications in civil engineering. Then if you see this picture, it shows like uh, a motorway in France. The um, 
geosynthetic advancement has reached a level that you can build very complex structures. Here in this picture, what you are seeing is a multi-tiered retaining wall, which is used for a uh, highway uh, built in hilly terrain. If you can understand this structure, see each of these walls are independently built using geosynthetics and this looks very natural and gets merged with the hilly terrain and it also is vegetated enough so that it looks like a wonderful uh, road Out, uh, outside you don't see anything any geosynthetic is not uh, visible outside it looks like one of the naturally uh, made uh, retaining wall multi tiered retaining wall and uh, this is a very recent uh, application of geosynthetics uh, we usually for tunnels when we make tunnels tunnels are lined uh, you they are short created and you use uh, liners to protect from any uh, leakage uh, from inside the rocks or you know to stop uh, any weathering um, of outer layer of this uh, tunnel and there are multiple purposes of liner in tunnel serves for so uh, usually these liners are made with the cement concrete or using short crete and lot of other materials which are very expensive and you cannot guarantee 100 percent sealing of these tunnels using those materials so a very recent advancement of geosynthetics in this particular area is to create a hydrostatic pressure resistant tunnel lining this has been uh, practiced in many countries including america european uh, countries and uh, several other places uh, using geosynthetics, they could actually uh, create a perfect ceiling and uh, uh, a very flexible and very economical tunnel, tunnel lining system. And geosynthetics also help in mitigating uh, failures due to natural hazards. If you see this picture to your left shows a landslide uh, in Taiwan, which is very, very disastrous. You can see the entire freeway is blocked by the debris flow from the landslide. So if you have to do rehabilitation or if, if you want to actually construct slopes which are close to these highways, railways and uh, other uh, commuting um, you know, lifelines, it is better to use uh, reinforcement which is in the form of geosynthetics which is shown to your left. Uh, this diagram shows uh, how geosynthetics help in um, avoiding landslides. So I will go to this aspect when I talk more about reinforcing aspects of geosynthetics. But this is a slide I want to show you just to show that how uh, useful geosynthetics will be to avoid um, uh, natural hazards. And of course, one of the most important applications of geosynthetics is in the area of geoenvironmental engineering particularly to create landfills, engineered landfills, which will uh, help us to dump our waste in a very engineered manner, in a very compact manner, and also without contaminating our soils and groundwater resources, and also uh, to provide a landfill which can generate energy. So this has been a very um, um, popular trend in most of the developed countries that you convert a landfill into something very useful. In this picture, what you're seeing is a 2,200 acre landfill site, which is called Fresh Kills Landfill Site in New York. It's very famous. For a long time, this is the largest landfill site uh, in the world. And it served uh, the purpose of waste dumping for almost 50 years. And uh, even the uh, World Trade Center debris has been dumped in this landfill site. This landfill site is closed uh, almost like a 15 years back. And now uh, the government of uh, USA is like, um, uh, they are developing uh, this into a eco park, which is like, uh, which will be the largest park in New York. This is a 30 year long project, which is undergoing, which is uh, in progress right now. So geosynthetics play a vital role in uh, creating this kind of a wonderful eco park from waste dump sites. And in fact, I have personally visited several such sites in Chicago where they have built a beautiful soap factories and many other interesting facilities on dump sites. So this is a very welcoming um, application uh, for the sustainable world for the next generation. 
Now coming to uh, the slide which uh, where I will uh, describe what is a geosynthetic material. According to the American Society of Testing Materials, uh, geosynthetic is defined as a product manufactured from polymeric material used in conjunction with soil, rock, earth or any other geomaterial as an integral part of a human made project structure or system. So essentially geosynthetics are made from polymers. Since uh, they are made from polymers, they are very cheap compared to many other civil engineering materials. So we have different types of uh, geosynthetics. Uh, I can tell you there are like uh, every year there are new innovations in the area of geosynthetics and you have many different types of geosynthetics made from different kinds of polymers. Mostly we use uh, polypropylene or polyethylene for making geosynthetics. Major varieties of geosynthetics are geotextiles. These are kind of fabrics made from polymers. They look like any fabric uh, and they have they are non-woven and woven type of geotextiles. In woven type of geotextile, you have uh, warp and weft kind of uh, woven together like any fabric is uh, woven. And geogrids, these are uh, very stiff materials, have big apertures compared to geotextiles. These are extremely permeable. Even geotextiles are permeable. But geogrids have uh, large apertures. Uh, they are mainly used for reinforcement. And geomembranes, these are used for environmental applications. They are extremely impermeable, completely impermeable. And they are used as, um, uh, mostly their usage is in landfills. They are used for liner systems and cover systems of landfills. And geocells, these are three-dimensional polymeric cellular uh, confinement systems. These are made from uh, polyethylene or polypropylene, ultrasonically welded. And they come in a very collapsed form in a very compact manner from uh, site and they are expanded. Uh, and they are filled with the choice of material, mostly granular material, uh, sand or gravel or sometimes even cement concrete to make a perfect mat kind of foundation for your road structures, foundations, retaining walls, embankment bases. These are multiple purposes in civil engineering constructions. Geopipes, these are typically hydraulic uh, conductors. Uh, they uh, carry water in different applications like embankments, retaining walls, and uh, earth dams. And uh, the most important uh, part of this is they have these geotextile filters all around. So they allow uh, only water to pass through them and, <coughs> sorry, they stop the passage of soil particles and uh, hence they uh, they protect the soil from getting eroded away. And geofoam is uh, one of the recent uh, inventions in the field of geosynthetics. This is expanded polystyrene. You have these uh, typical packing materials which come with your um, um, computer packing. If you have seen, they look like thermocol, but it is not actually a thermocol. It is called geofoam. Uh, it is extensively being used in road building, retain wall construction and other applications. I will talk more about them when I go to the actual specific application. And then geotubes, these are very interesting products. Uh, these are made with the geotextiles and the filling material can be anything starting from uh, gravel, sand, clay, or even sometimes construction debris or even waste materials are used to fill these geotubes. Their particular application is erosion control, shore protection, and geonets. These are also polymeric material net type of structures. Typically, they are used on hilly slopes to protect the slopes from rockfall. You would uh, see them when you are traveling through hilly regions along Himalayas. Most of these um, hills are uh, being protected with the, these nets anchored to the rock slopes. Geofibers, these are uh, discrete uh, fibers which can be mixed with soil to improve the shear strength of the soil, which can be used for constructing different structures like embankments, retaining walls, and foundation beds. And uh, geocomposites are like a composite uh, made from uh, textile and grid, or woven geotextile and grid and a non-woven geotextile. Sometimes you also have a bentonite layer in between, which is called clay liner, uh, geosynthetic clay liner, popular application being uh, replacement of actual clay liners in landfill applications in civil engineering. 
so uh, in total we can actually um, classify the functions of uh, geosynthetics and they come under six major categories separation filtration drainage reinforcement containment of liquid or gas and erosion control now uh, what type of uh, geosynthetic material helps in what type of function this table gives you a brief overview of this uh, application of geosynthetics in various uh, uh, functions geotextile can be used as a separator filter drain or reinforcement it is also used for erosion control but it cannot be used in containment applications because it is a permeable material whereas geo grid having bigger apertures it cannot be used as a separator filter or drain but its own applic only application is reinforcement because it possesses very high tensile strength and geo membrane it is a uh, impermeable material its main application is containment used in landfills or any containment applications geo cells these three dimensional uh, cellular networks they are used as separators reinforcement and erosion control geo tubes their main application is for drainage and containment and geo pipes also drainage and containment whereas geo foam is used for separator it is uh, also used for uh, damping properties uh, increasing damping properties in applications where soils are subjected to high dynamic loads like transport related dynamic loads or even earthquake related dynamic loads geo nets are used for drainage and erosion control and mostly rockfall protection in slopes geo fibers are only used for reinforcement and geo composites serve all different applications or purposes of geosynthetics now i'll quickly go through uh, different types of functions served by geosynthetics let me start with this function called separation separation is uh, creating a barrier between two different materials the difference could be in their grain size or uh, the way the, their physical properties for example a typical application of geosynthetics as a separator comes in roads either unpaved road or in a paved road in a typical uh, road section you see a subgrade and then a base course and sub, sub base and base course and subgrade is if you have a very soft subgrade most of the times it is the situation in our indian roads the subgrade being very soft and particularly becomes much softer during rainy season and when you do not have any um, intermediate interface between the sub base which is typically an aggregate layer this uh, during rainy season the subsoil becomes very soft and the uh, aggregate will try to penetrate or it will penetrate this subgrade because of this penetration two things happen first thing is the thickness of granular layer or sub base layer reduces because part of the sub base is sinking into the subgrade and the second thing is it also uh, the subsoil which has become very uh, soft will get pumped into the subgrade making it uh, this is called uh, aggregate fouling the clay material which is um, uh, slushy it gets pumped into sub base and makes this sub base uh, coated with this uh, clay thus by reducing the uh, shear strength why will it reduce shear strength because the friction between the particles of these aggregates is the main reason for uh, shear strength in this aggregate layer and when these aggregate particles are coated with the soil coming from the subgrade they lose their friction so the entire bearing capacity which is offered by this sub base will reduce so the thickness reduces its load carrying capacity reduces leading to potholes ruts all kinds of damages on your roads which you will be seeing in rainy season so in this kind of a situation if you provide a geosynthetic separator which can be a geo textile or a geo cell layer what it does is it separates these two uh, subgrade and sub base layers so there is no chance that these aggregates will penetrate into the sub base the thickness of this geo um, i mean this sub base is reduced uh, you can use a smaller thickness because you do not have any loss of this layer due to uh, penetration second thing is it will also arrest the pumping of subsoil from the subgrade into the aggregate layer thus it gives a perfect protection in road building 
So this is this picture also shows you how this separation works even under loads. When you have uh, wheel loads coming onto the road section, uh, this is unreinforced without any geotextile and with geotextile, how would they perform under the loads? When you have a separator, even if you have settlements, they are kind of distributed and there is no mixing of particles between top layer and the bottom layer. So uh, this is how we use geosynthetics as separators in it is being used in most of the road networks across the world. Geosynthetics are very, very, um, I mean, popular and uh, very common in road applications. The next function is filtration. Filtration is uh, allowance of water or hydraulic uh, uh, material to pass through the pores, but stopping the soil particles to pass through the pores. So this function is very useful when we are creating uh, kind of hydraulic barriers. I mean, even like uh, when you have sand filters, uh, they act uh, similar to sand filters. They allow water to move through the uh, soil, but they retain all soil particles, so they stop the erosion of uh, uh, soil. This typical application is uh, along these um, slopes where you have riprap, and uh, if you have not protected the riprap with any geosynthetic fabric below, then there is this erosion of soil happening slowly when the water falls into the soil. The soil particles get through into the riptrap and they just flow along with water and typically the, the slope will fail. So uh, this can be arrested by providing a layer of geotextile below the riprap or even in case of a drain, if you have a granular drain or a geopipe drain, you can wrap it with a non-woven geotextile. So it allows for the passage of water and it completely uh, retains the soil particles. So uh, it stops the erosion of soil in many different applications. And the next most important application is drainage. One of the most uh, common problems are uh, the uh, problems which we are not able to solve in geotechnical engineering is long-term consolidation settlements of soft clays. When your clay is very uh, soft, and uh, typically, if you want to uh, build a structure, these days we do not have restrictions on what type of soil can be used for building a typical structure. Earlier days, we used to ask, what is the pairing capacity of the soil? But with the advent of a lot of uh, ground improvement techniques and geosynthetics, we are in uh, a generation where we ask for how much bearing capacity do you want? So how do we achieve such a bearing capacity in soft soils? And how do you consolidate soft soils? Once you build a multi-story structure on a soft soil, and with time, the consolidation settlements keep on uh, increasing, and then the structure will settle by few meters. So we are not allowed to do this. So the best solution for this kind of a situation is allow the clay to settle completely before you construct anything. How do you do that? This is typically done by accelerating the entire consolidation process by introducing artificial drains into the soil. So these artificial drains are prefabricated vertical drains are made using geosynthetic materials. So apart from the vertical drainage which happens in soils naturally and which is very slow, the introduction of these uh, prefabricated vertical drains allows for radial drainage. So it uh, allows for immediate consolidation of the entire clay layer and with preloading and vacuum you can accelerate this much further so a clay layer uh, particularly when you are building something very close to uh, ports uh, in marine environment where the clays will settle few meters and also the loads from the containers are very heavy this kind of uh, consolidation using prefabricated vertical drains is very common and a clay layer which typically takes 100 years for settling one meter would be able to settle within three to four months with the application of drains and uh, uh, preloading. This is a very phenomenal advancement when you are trying to build structures quickly and uh, efficiently. This is the picture where I am showing uh, where usually these drains are made using sand. Initial days, people used to consolidate uh, soils using sand drains. You have clay soil, then you install these sand drains using vibroflotation and any other technique. And then this gives a radial consolidation to the soil. That's, the, that's why the soil will be able to quickly consolidate it. 
but these sand rains are very expensive and we do not have any sand available freely and we we are actually the sand uh, deposits are depleting very fast so we are not allowed to use sand for natural sand for our constructions so these sand drains are effectively replaced by prefabricated vertical drains what i was talking about since the limitations of sand drains are they are very expensive and uh, their drainage properties are not um, uh, adequate and sometimes there are smear effects the soil surrounding the uh, sand will get into the sand drain and make it uh, less effective and uh, they are also uh, very expensive and they are not sand is not available so in that case prefabricated vertical drains come for our rescue you can actually replace the sand with very thin bands of uh, drains these are actually if you have seen this this looks like less than half of your palm size uh, in its width and it is it can it comes in a roll i'll show you a picture so this comes as a roll this is the roll which has this drain it's very flexible it comes in hundreds and meters of roll and if you see very closely it has a core which is made with the uh, uh, geosynthetic material a core and the outer layer which is also a non woven geotextile the inner geosynthetic core acts like a drain because it has these panels which will allow this band shaped cross section with the polypropylene core which has channels which allow for quick draining out of water from the soil and the outer geosynthetic layer allows for filtration that is it doesn't allow soil particles get into the drain so these drains are actually installed into the soil very quickly uh, you will not be you will be totally amazed if i say that these drains of like about 50 meters uh, long drain into a clay deposit can be installed in less than a minute you can do uh, two or three in a minute it's a very quick process you actually install it using an anchor anchor and uh, this uh, has a this is called stitching because it's like just like stitching a cloth you will be stitching the soil with these drains so once you this is how you the uh, geo uh, synthetic drain goes into the soil imagine like the entire uh, sand drain which is almost like 1 meter diameter 50 meters depth is being replaced with with this thin layer of thin band of geosynthetic material which can serve better than the uh, sand drain so once you reach the correct height you will cut the drain and move to the next position where you have to install the drain and this picture shows you like installation of prefabricated vertical drains for a, uh, a for the construction of a, a air uh, aircraft uh, parts this is a project where aircraft parts are being constructed and they have to build a heavy uh, structure here so they want to consolidate the entire soil using drain so you can install these drains in no time and they will serve for accelerating the consolidation of clay soils and then the next function is containment this is a, a very uh, important application of geosynthetics because waste dumping has become a biggest uh, engineering threat to the present generation in particular in, in in our country we do not have engineered landfills most of the uh, fill, fills what we call landfills are just dumps waste dumps so we do not have any protection so the waste during rainy season water percolates through the waste and it contaminates the soil and it goes into the groundwater and pollutes the entire stream or groundwater so it is the biggest environmental hazard to avoid this we need to build these landfills which are engineered landfills so the advantage is one is we dump the waste in a very systematic manner you can dump more maximum volume of waste because we will be compacting it in layers and we will be also reinforcing this waste and sometimes you uh, also uh, provide this uh, layer at the below which is called uh, composite geosynthetic clay liner earlier days it used to be a just bentonite layer bentonite is a clay material which is very thick and it is expensive so you can remove because bentonite is an impermeable clay which can seal the waste from entering the groundwater but the problem is it cannot be 100% leak proof at the same time it is also expensive and sometimes it cracks during uh, dry, dry seasons and these cracks also allow for leakage of waste water through the uh, layer uh, the liner 
So to avoid all these problems, you can replace the entire clay layer with the geosynthetic uh, liner. So this is a geomembrane, which is 100% leak proof. It provides perfect uh, lining system for a landfill. And you also have the cover system. Since the rainwater falls into the waste and it generates, uh, uh, it decomposes and it creates a lot of uh, problem, you can actually stop the rainwater from allowing getting into the waste by providing this cap using geosynthetics. So using this kind of engineered uh, landfills, you can actually generate a lot of uh, energy, which is being done in many of the countries. So a waste dump can be converted into energy resource, which is happening in many other countries. You see a typical engineered landfill consists of uh, layers of geosynthetics. Uh, you can also have a grid at the base to provide more stability to this geomembrane layer, which are providing as a liner. You can have a cap system, which is made using geosynthetic. You can actually increase the capacity by several, uh, you know, cube, uh, thousands of cubic uh, tons by cubic feet by using these geosynthetics. And the next application is erosion control. Uh, typically, when you have a slope which is uh, open to rainwater, you have different types of erosions happening. One is a splash. When the rain droplet falls onto the slope, it will actually splash. And when it is splashing, it will take away some of the soil particles along with it. The next one is sheet. The rain particles will rain will be the water will be flowing on the surface of the uh, slope and it will form a sheet and the sheet will take uh, the outer cover of your soil along with its passage. Then there are also rills and gullies which are formed during because there is the rainwater follows its own way path. So it creates kind of gullies on the slope which will further uh, increase the erosion. And then at the base of this slope, there will be a stream or channel which will be flowing from the gullies, splashed water and sheet, whatever what, water comes to the base. It will form a stream and along the stream, the bottom portion or the toe portion of the slope gets washed away. Because of that, you have a severe slope stability problem in this. One is erosion, the other one is slope stability. So to stop this, usually we provide riprap for erosion uh, control. So when you do not have any geosynthetic fabric uh, at the base of the riprap, there is a, uh, always a possibility that uh, the soil from the slope will get into the riprap and it eventually gets washed away. So by providing a filtration geotextile at the bottom of uh, your riprap, you can actually improve the erosion control capacity of this entire system. Uh, similarly, in the channels, you have cha open channels, you can actually protect the channel slopes and the channel bottom using geotextiles. So they provide perfect uh, erosion control uh, facility for this kind of slopes and channels. So on the slopes, you can also provide geocells. Geocells being three-dimensional, you can grow vegetation in these geocells. I will show more slides about how popular these uh, geocell covering systems for growing vegetation. Since you can grow vegetation, this becomes a completely green solution for erosion control. Even for the channels, you won't even see these products outside. You will only be seeing the green cover. So this is this picture shows a huge slope, a very high slope, which is actually uh, next to a railway line being protected with the uh, geo cells. There is a geo cell layer laid on the slope and then the grass is grown in this geo cell uh, pocket. So once the grass is grown, the roots of this grass also penetrate into the soil. They provide natural reinforcement to the soil. It's called bioreinforcement. This you have a two-way protection. One using this geocell, which is filled with soil. The second one by growing this vegetation. So you won't even know that this entire slope is protected using geocentric. It looks completely a natural green kind of a solution. And the most important application of geosynthetics is reinforcement. Why do you need reinforcement for soils? If you, uh, many of you will be knowing in structural engineering why we use steel reinforcement to protect cement concrete from uh, failure. Why do we use steel? Uh, because steel is a ductile material and it actually provides uh, ductility to the structure. If you do not have steel reinforcement, you will have a brittle failure in concrete. By providing steel reinforcement, the ductility, which is the ability of uh, 
a material to take more loads more strains without getting failed so when you can improve the ductility you have uh, the less possibility of failure similar thing happens in soils also soils are very weak in tension they are strong in compression they are uh, moderately strong in shear but they are very very weak in tension so an unreinforced soil if you try to plot a stress strain response it will look like this it has a st uh, strain softening kind of a behavior which is a and also a brittle kind of a failure whereas in reinforced soil you can take large strains without failing and the load carrying capacity also increases so this technique has been practiced by humans from a long time i mean it's like even in 12th 13th centuries people used this technique of reinforcement without knowing that it is a reinforcement technique if you try to observe these uh, uh, structures called ziggurats uh, which are in uh, ancient mesopotamia uh, present iraq all these ziggurats which are actually their temples to worship gods are built using soil reinforced with natural fibers they are still standing uh, showing the uh, ability of reinforced earth to sustain centuries and if you see this very important structure on the uh, earth's face which is the uh, great wall of china uh, the west side of this china wall is made using a mixture of water and fine gravel reinforced with willow reeds which are natural fibers and it is uh, still standing uh and then the modern form of reinforcement which is in the form of metallic reinforcement was uh, actually invented by a person called henry vital in france so he uh, has discovered it in a kind of a serendipity which is like he didn't mean to invent it but when he was uh, playing on seashore uh, with his children he realized that he was able to construct a stable sand castles and uh, sand castles to um, taller sand castles can be built when you reinforce the sand with uh, cones the pine cones so this made him think that how this can be made using these pine cones what is the property of the pine cone which is allowing the sand to stand for a uh, sand taller and stable so this idea has transformed uh, his thinking and he has applied for his phd in this area and he has uh, uh, actually obtained phd in this uh, subject called uh, terra ame terra ame is uh, reinforced earth in french and by this name he has created a firm he started a company called La terra ame uh, which is reinforced earth company in 1964 and then from then onwards the reinforce soil reinforcement te technique has seen several advancements if you see in henry widdell's uh, original um, explanation for soil reinforcement technique what he observed is when you have granular soil you have a, a layer of granular soil resting on another layer of granular soil in a typical sand deposit when you apply normal load on this and try to apply shear this happens in any geotechnical structure the shear forces will be acting on them so when you apply shear and there is if there is no uh, reinforcement in between the sand particles the sand particles will try to interact with each other only through friction between the particles and then since there is no tensile stress or there is no bond between particles there is no cohesion between gran particles in granular soils the uh, friction developed won't be enough to sustain the shear forces which are which are uh, generated in the soil so if you can provide a geosynthetic material or no in his uh, case he has provided metallic reinforcement when you provide a, a tensile member tensile element in the soil what happens is um, there is a, a bond developed between soil and the tensile member and if the uh, tensile capacity of this material is more than the pull which is happening due to shear then you can avoid failure in the soil so this is the technique through which he has built his first wall of uh, uh, reinforced structure using metallic reinforcement in 1964 and this structure is even uh, now it is standing in it is 56 years old after that uh, from then onwards millions of reinforced soil structures are built worldwide and this picture shows uh, for any civil engineer to understand how the strength improvement happens during uh, using reinforcement 
a more circle is the best explanation to show you how the shear strength of soil can be increased using um, reinforcement. See, if you have a unreinforced soil, which is, which is uh, see, uh, imagine a soil which is tested in compression. So this is not a triaxial compression. Here, it is, is a uniaxial compression. You don't have any confinement here. So in that case, your Mohr circle will pass through origin because uh, the sigma 3, which is the minor principal stress, is zero here. And you will have a minor, major principal stress or vertical stress sigma 1 plotted here in a Mohr circle. And the friction angle of soil is actually is less. And because of that, the soil will fail. The failure envelope is actually falling here, so it will fail. How do you increase uh, its uh, capacity to sustain the failure? You can actually apply some confinement. So in a typical triaxial test, you apply cell pressure. When you have sigma 3, the soil strength is increased. You, If you have ever conducted a triaxial uh, test in lab, you would have noticed that with increase in sigma 3 value, you will end up with increase in sigma 1 also. That means more confining pressure allows you to apply more normal loads onto the soil. So if you have confining pressure, your more circle shifts uh, to the right. So sigma 3 plots not at the zero, but it is it has a different value. And with the increase in sigma 3, your sigma 1 starts increasing. So when you have reinforcement, reinforcement, what it does is you have two layers of reinforcement and the sand layer is getting sandwiched between these two layers of reinforcement. Because of this, the reinforcement creates a kind of confinement in the soil. So this confinement provides additional confining pressure, which can be seen as the increase in the minor principal stress, eventually resulting in increase in major principal stress. So a composite, reinforced composite will have the same friction angle, but a cohesion is induced into the soil, even though the soil is granular, because of the confinement effect of reinforcement, it will uh, create a kind of apparent cohesion into the soil, which is the reason for its increased shear strength and uh, its capacity to resist failure. So with this uh, background or concept, people started building these walls, which are called mechanically stabilized earth walls because you have a reinforcement in the form of steel strips inside your retaining wall. So there are millions of such uh, retaining walls built all around the world. You can see a lot many case studies in this area from Google or any uh, uh, particular journal which is dedicated to soil reinforcement. And the problem with this metallic reinforcement is originally uh, when they don't have proper corrosion protection, it started getting corroded, which was reducing its lifetime. And uh, even though it is protected against corrosion, the steel uh, reinforcement is expensive. So uh, the, though they have built several uh, reinforced soil structures using metallic reinforcement, with time it has become unpopular because it is very expensive for developing countries. So in this uh, process, the geosynthetics were uh, introduced. This is how the geosynthetics are invented uh, to uh, reduce the uh, eco uh, economical burden of metallic reinforcement in reinforced soil structures. People have invented geosynthetics. These are polymers, they are cheap. They can effectively replace uh, metallic reinforcement in reinforced retaining walls. Though the initial application was to reinforce retaining walls, it has uh, started to increase or spread into different applications. Like I already shown different uh, functions of uh, this geosynthetics. So the original application was reinforcement and geosynthetics very, became very popular immediately because they have better quality control because they are manufactured in a factory environment. You have excellent uh, uh, quality control and their properties can never go wrong. And they can be installed very quickly, unlike your retaining walls, which are built using cement concrete. These can be built in uh, less than tenth, one tenth of uh, the time which is needed for uh, other kinds of gravity retaining walls. And they generally replace raw material resources. They replace a lot of gravel, sand, soil in these constructions. And they also make the designs very simplified and they are extremely cost competitive. And uh, they are very uh, easily available, widely available all over the world. And their technical database is very well established by now. 
So uh, the uh, geosynthetics which are mainly used for reinforcement are textiles. These are like woven geotextiles and non-woven geotextile. Mostly non-woven geotextiles are used for filtration applications, but woven geotextiles are used for reinforcement. They are uh, having good tensile strength. And geogrids, these are two types. One is biaxial geogrid, other one is uniaxial geogrid. If you have apertures in a square pattern, they are called biaxial. And if your apertures are elongated, they are called uniaxial geogrids. Uniaxial geogrids are mostly used in plain strain kind of applications, whereas biaxial geogrids are mostly used in applications where you have three dimensional stresses. And the most important advancement of geosynthetics in the field of reinforcing soils is geocells. These geocells are three dimensional polymeric honeycombed type of cellular structures made from um, polymers, and they have these uh, cells interconnected. At junctions, these are ultrasonically welded junctions. When it comes from factory, a geocell is in a collapsed form, which occupies very less space. So you can actually transport um, thousands of uh, meters of these geocells, running meters of geocells in a truck. And when you bring it to the site, you can expand it. And it has seen a lot of advancements. And at present, you can have friction also. You have these um, uh, surface of the geocells uh, made very rough so that it can create a lot of friction so that you have more stability. And also you have these apertures or holes which are meant for drainage so that pore water pressures do not develop inside these cells so that you will avoid any kind of, uh, you know, loss in effective strength. So uh, geotextile mainly uh, in its uh, function as reinforcement develops shear strength through friction between soil and geotextile. Whereas geogrid has both friction and interlocking because the particles can get trapped into these apertures which are big. This can actually be more effective than geotextile because it provides friction and interlocking with less material. Whereas geocell uh, is friction, interlocking and also confinement and beam effect. So uh, reinforced soil structures, I'm showing you in what all applications they are used. One is for retaining wall, and then they are used as foundation uh, bed reinforcement. And then embankments on weak soils can be reinforced using geocells or geotextiles. And then in unpaved and paved roads uh, for reinforcing and also for slope stability. So in a reinforced retaining wall, uh, basic components are one is facing unit, uh, which is a cement concrete block, and then reinforcement inside the fill. And then you have a backfill, which is uh, typically a granular fill. So the concept of the reinforced retaining wall is when you do not have reinforcement and when you subject it to a kind of surcharge, you have a more vertical and horizontal uh, deformations. When you reinforce with layers of uh, geosynthetics, you have very less uh, vertical deformations and horizontal deformation is almost zero because of the confinement effect, which is produ provided due to this reinforcement. In a typical reinforced retaining wall, the failure envelope falls much below, much before the length of reinforcement so that there is a bond or anchorage developed. So the failure surface actually, uh, it cuts this reinforcement at some point. So this, uh, the additional reinforcement pre provided beyond this failure plane provides the bond which is required for reducing uh, sliding uh, increasing sliding stability, overturning stability, and also providing excellent bond and uh, uh, overall stability. These are the different types of geosynthetic reinforced soil walls. Uh, the first one shows a full height panel walls. These are typically used in most of the Japanese constructions uh, for their high speed corridor projects. You have one concrete panel for the full height and inside you have these reinforcing layers. And then you have segmental panel walls. These are mostly used in our country. Uh, these panels are, uh, they provide facing. These are in the form of a swastik or any typical structure which fit, fits into uh, each other. And then you have layers of reinforcement inside. And you can also have modular block facing where these are hollow blocks made of concrete filled with uh, granular soil or gravel. And uh, they are actually stacked together and you can have reinforcement inside. There is a batter for this entire wall to give more stability to the wall. 
and then you do not want to use any concrete into the construction you can actually use a geotextile wrapped retaining wall the geotextile here provides reinforcement as well as facing here because this can be brought to the front and it can be wrapped around this layer or the lift so that it we need it doesn't need any extra facing for the retaining wall so these are wrap around walls you can see this is a jute wrap around wall in this picture and you can have different types of wrap around walls you just completely use only geocentrics for construction this is a full height panel wall and this is a segmental panel wall. Uh, most of our road over bridges and approach roads are built using this technique in our country. And this is a modular block wall, again, for a lot of uh, abutments, road over bridges, and retaining walls. And geocell retaining walls are one of the most important structures. My PhD topic was on geocell uh, supported embankment. So I have a, a biased opinion about geocells. I always think they are better than any type, other type of geocentric materials. So in this, the advantage in using geocells for retaining walls is you don't need anything uh, uh, other than geocells and soil. These geocells are providing facing as well as reinforcement in the retaining wall. So it, it provides a great stability as well as uh, stability against all kinds of uh, uh, earthquake loads. I will uh, show you an interesting explanation on how geocell retaining walls can be built. These are just uh, retain geocells brought from factory expanded at the site and filled with soil and then they are stacked together to make this retaining wall so it takes very less time to construct this type of wall because you don't need any extra machinery it's a very simple design and it can never go wrong at the same time it has extreme flexibility if you observe this structure carefully if you have a wall a concrete wall and you have a retaining wall like this the soil pressure, lateral earth pressure acting on the wall can actually uh, break this wall in a way that uh, the failure is kind of very brittle. You have disastrous failure. Once the, uh, the lateral earth pressure exceeds the capacity, then the wall will fail uh, suddenly. Since there is no flexibility in such a system, it's a rigid retaining wall. Whereas in a geocell retaining wall, if you observe, you have these stacked geocells. So this is a flexible structure. Failure can never be catastrophic. Failure, because the lateral pressures acting on this wall can only deform the wall to a certain extent, but the deformations can be, they are not cumulative, they will be adjusted throughout the height of the wall so that even if you have a failure, it becomes very localized and it is a very rare occasion. So you can also uh, uh, plant these grass seeds into this uh, geocell pockets they well, they actually work excellent like uh, flower parts you can put these grass seeds uh, specific grass seeds like uh, vertiware which can have very long root system which we can go inside the soil and stabilize the entire retaining wall so after one year of completion you will not even see geocells on the surface you will only see the vegetation which is grown and a very stable green aesthetic uh, kind of a retaining wall built and you can have multi-tiered walls which can be built uh, to any height like i have shown you initially the a40 motorway in france and geofoam is another excellent material which is uh, expanded polystyrene the advantage of using geo, uh, geo foam uh, in retaining walls is it replaces all the soil which can be uh, you know um, not available at a particular site so you uh, have multifold advantages like you don't have this transportation cost of soil if it reduces the carbon footprint for the project at the same time it has this soil may not have excellent damping properties whereas geofoam is a highly um, you know it's a damper so any kind of vibration or seismic forces dynamic loads which are acting on the walls are absorbed completely by this geofoam so if your loads are not very heavy they are live loads from traffic you can easily go with this geofoam walls so they are uh, very lightweight, so you can actually lift one complete block and then they provide lesser forces to the retaining wall backfill. So the pressure on the, uh, I mean, the driving forces for which cause the instability will reduce. At the same time, they increase the dynamic stability of the wall and damping characteristics of the wall. You also save a lot of materials, uh, natural resources, so it becomes a very sustainable construction. 
and for reinforced foundations if you talk about foundations many times your soils are very weak they will not be able to take lot of uh, loads which are coming from structures so uh, you will be unnecessarily going for very deep foundations but you can have very economical sustainable constructions using geosynthetics because you can improve the bearing capacity of soil enormously the picture to your right the plot from one of my uh, research students you can see that uh, an unreinforced soil may have a plate load test if you conduct an unreinforced soil and a reinforced soil with using different types of geosynthetics your load bearing capacity can be increased up to 3 to 4 times using geosynthetics so that will enable us to build tall or heavy structures without going for very deep foundations thus saving lot of resources and also having very sustainable constructions so the concept here is uh, when you have this loads coming onto the soil you have a uh, soil moving downwards and upwards one part of the soil moves upwards and the part the part of the soil below the foundation moves downwards you have a slip circle typically formed below the footing and when you have this reinforcing layers they typically intersect with this slip surfaces which are formed below the foundation and the extremely high tensile forces are developed at the intersection of reinforcement and soil that this uh, tensile forces are responsible for increase in shear strength and increase in the entire load bearing capacity of your foundation so you are typically a bearing capacity ratio which is defined as the bearing capacity of reinforced soil to the bearing capacity of unreinforced soil the value can be almost like 4 to 6 times as per many researchers so you can have large increase in your bearing capacity using geosynthetics and the next kind of uh, application uh, of reinforced uh, soil is embankments if you are building an embankment on a weak soil you have three different types of failures possible one is bearing capacity failure because your foundation soil is weak uh, the rotational failure which happens uh, due to um, failure surface extending into so the embankment as well as the foundation and the lateral spreading which is due to the weak uh, embankment soil itself so all these types of failures can be avoided by placing reinforcement in the form of geosynthetic strategically either at the base or within the embankment so you can have very stable you can build uh, you know high speed trains on soft soils which is possible which is shown in many countries like korea and japan you can build bullet trains on very heavy duty uh, uh, embankments load carrying embankments uh, on soft soils using geosynthetics and even if you have uh, locally weak zones or sinkholes below the embankments if you have differential settlements everything can be arrested by providing layers of geosynthetics in these embankments and geocells particularly come to your rescue when you have very soft foundations particularly when your soft clays are thin they are getting sandwiched between a hard stratum and the hard embankment your geocell layer can become a very effective solution so this is a typical plot from my phd thesis which shows that i have an embankment on a very very soft soil uh, created in the laboratory model and i have a layer of geocell below the uh, embankment so when i do not have any reinforcement my embankment settles a lot and also it deforms laterally a lot whereas if i use reinforcement the uh, deformations are completely brought into control even lateral deformations and vertical deformations can be brought down uh, to a lot uh, to a large extent using geocells and when we are using geosynthetics in slopes i am showing you a picture of a, a slope collapse in a darjeeling uh, no sorry this one is from coor landslide a very recent uh, landslide uh, due to floods in kerala and coor this kind of a situation happens when you you have a rainy season particularly the rain water percolating into the slope so it actually um, has a detrimental effect on slope stability because it increases the weight of the soil in slope thus uh, the driving force which brings down the slope increases and then it also increases the pore water pressures inside the soil 
so the effective stress and the shear strength of the soil reduces so because of this the slope will uh, collapse or it gets uh, you know uh, slipping into the uh, downstream side so this is a very typical slope failure which happens in monsoon season and even if there is no monsoon sometimes your horizontal uh, forces due to earthquakes can also cause landslides so in such situations if you can actually you want to rehabilitate this existing slope or if you want to build a new slope an engineered slope you can use these reinforcing layers in slope when you use reinforcement in slopes what happens is the failure surface gets intersected by reinforcement and you have this uh, resistance developed at uh, every point of intersection of failure surface with reinforcement so you can build very steep slopes which are uh, strong against uh, these uh, forces due to rain and earthquake and next application of reinforced earth is in uh, unpaved roads i have already explained this uh, in my initial slides so it can act as a separator as well as a reinforcement to the uh, roads so when you use geocentric layers under a vehicular traffic in a unpaved road see this will actually increase lot of confinement i already told you delta uh, sigma h which is confining pressure increases and you have reduced uh, vertical stress acting at any soil element below the ground in the subsurface so this reduces your vertical and horizontal settlements completely so this is a very uh, popular type of uh, reinforcement technique in unpaved roads it, and also when you are doing a rehabilitation of a, a road which is damaged you are trying to repair it by uh, using a, a new pavement and a old pavement if you do not use any geosynthetic layer in between what happens is the cracks with are, which are which are already formed in the old pavement can be transmitted easily into the new pavement to stop this kind of a uh, uh, transmission of uh, these uh, cracks you can use geosynthetic interlayers which will control uh, the transmission of cracks and uh, they also delay the appearance of these cracks and thus they uh, reduce the maintenance cost and also save lot of material in the overlay thickness and when you use geo cells for this kind of applications you have this beam effect because the geo cell if you see in a cellular network any geo cell is subjected to all round confining pressure by the uh, pressurizing of each cell surrounding one cell and also there is a friction developed along the uh, walls of this cell so the slip surfaces which are formed in an unreinforced soil are actually the reduced and your loads are distributed for a shallower depth when you distribute the loads over shallow depths you can have weaker soils below the uh, ground so this will not actually affect your performance of the road so they actually work like mat foundations it is called a beam effect of geo cell in uh, road sections so the another advantage of geo cells in roads is you don't have any waiting period the moment you spread geo cells and you fill it with soil you can run heavy trucks so the uh, waiting period for this kind of uh, roads is very less you can build it in very quickly and very easily and you can also fill these cells with cement concrete making them super strong for applications like railway tracks if you have bullet trains uh, which have heavy loads coming you can use these grids and you can also fill the cells with the uh, uh, cement concrete to make a extra strong uh, reinforcement and even airfield runways are being built using geosynthetics and uh, geo cells and rockfall protection is another typical application of geosynthetics because you have these geo nets made of polymers which are anchored to slopes so they will stop all these rock falls they have they are they look very thin but they are very strong against this boulder fall and rock fall so they protect your lifelines against uh, slopes which are very close to your uh, railway tracks and highways and geosynthetics are also used for pl flood protection uh geo tubes i already shown you these are geosynthetics filled with any choice of material these days construction debris is popularly used to fill these geo tubes these are used for pl flood protection they uh, they avoid they stop the flood they actually reduce the wave forces they stop erosion they also provide tsunami protection in some of the countries so a closer look of a geo tube looks like this 
and not very difficult to uh, use this and when you use it you can actually protect your entire county from flood uh, there are lot many case studies available so you can actually be very safe during flood season using these geotubes and even for score protection in the ocean you use geo bags these are different from geotubes they look like a gunny bags made of uh, polymers of course they are filled again with uh, soil or waste materials they are laid along the they can be very flexible in their design they follow this shoreline closely and you can have very uh, strong and score protected shore using geo bags and you can even provide protection to these bags by providing a gabion mattress gabion mattress is a kind of a galvanized uh, uh, wire mattress which can be used for containing these geo bags they are also used for slope protection if you have seen many of these hilly terrains in our country are also protected using gabion mattress or reno mattress which are uh, which are uh, also used for growing vegetation on the slopes this is another uh, very important uh, or very interesting application which is called marine mattress it you have a net kind of a polymeric um, structure the entire thing which is very huge is filled with uh, uh, stones this can be used for score protection this particular one is used in by nasa uh, in florida to uh, arrest the bridge score uh, in in one of their projects you can see that the sea uh, scoring can be arrested using these marine mattresses which which are being also used in our country recently so why are we calling geosynthetic sustainable though they are polymers they are called sustainable and green because they save a lot of natural resources uh, you use less soil less gravel less uh, um, natural materials and you use automatic construction methods which will re reduce lot of energy consumption and you use reused uh, reusable recycled eco friendly materials so they are uh, sustainable they reduce waste uh, in a construction project and they lower the carbon footprint that is why geosynthetics are uh, marked as green uh, can everyone be muted please i am getting disturbed by the talk can the organizers move everyone uh, yes uh, please uh, mrs sanjay p mishra if you can hear me mrs sanjay p mishra if you can hear me please mute your mic mrs sanjay mishra please mute your mic if you can hear me you know that's disturbing maybe he doesn't know uh, ravi if you can uh, scan through the participants list and do that yes please yeah, yeah go ahead this man so uh, geosynthetics are marked as green in most of the countries and most of the projects in developed countries uh, they have to show that why they are not using geosynthetics so geosynthetic usage is mandatory for several road building projects and scar protection projects in developed countries and if they are not using geosynthetics they have to get a legal uh, advice i mean legal proof that why they are not using geosynthetics in their projects but compared to many other countries usage of geosynthetics was very small in our country till last uh, decade we were using only 5% of the total uh, geosynthetics used all around the world uh, uh, but in the one decade it's been very promising and uh, our codes also started talking about geosynthetics and they have entered our codes and lot of uh, new infrastructure development projects are using geosynthetics in many ways in particular in our road development projects because we have the largest i think second largest road network in the world so the economic importance of geosynthetics is also uh, important for us to understand because geosynthetics are durable they are long lasting they are environmentally safe and they are non reactive to soil so we can safely use them with soil groundwater water drinking water everything 3% to 5% of the total cost of the projects uh, is used for uh, geosynthetics whereas you save 30% of saving in the total project cost and you can also minimize the regular repair and maintenance cost and unless like i mean if you are not using geosynthetics most of the times even you rehabilitate a road project during rainy seasons it can be like every monsoon season you have to repair it but if you go for a sustainable solution it can stay for 3 to 4 years without any maintenance 
and they minimize pollution lead to efficient use of natural resources and then uh, they prevent potential ecological disasters like floods droughts uh, earthquakes global warming with minimal cost and they are difficult or impossible to degrade and inert and they can be disposed of without the danger of contamination and they act as contaminant barrier to toxic materials they provide sealing and capping of pollution so they are green they are sustainable i will uh, only take another 5 minutes i will discuss uh, some very few, uh, interesting case studies this is a development of new port at gangavaram in visakhapatnam port where i have gone for my summer uh, project during my mtech so they were using prefabricated vertical drains i think one of the very oldest uh, case studies on pvds in our country so it's very interesting to see like how pvds were being installed uh, in this port to uh, consolidate the entire uh, land within 6 months duration by using prefabricated vertical drains and uh, preloading so they have uh, used uh, up to 10 meters to 18 meters depth of pvds and uh, with a spacing of 1 meter or 1.5 meters they could finish the consolidation within like uh, 174 days and another very recent case study of our country is uh, sikkim airport uh, pakyang airport is very beautiful airport because of its location because it is uh, located on a hill when you are building a airport on a hill you have uh, the biggest challenge because uh, whatever material you are using should be consummate with uh, the material which is already existing which is rock so you need to have material which are as strong as your rock so that you can have no modulus difference between the materials so that you will not expect any deformations during its performance and service life so the sikkim airport is uh, built by mcafery india which is like uh, one of the world's tallest reinforced structures 80 meters in height so they have used paramesh system high strength geogrid along with the green terramesh along the slopes where you can grow vegetation if you see some of these pictures on net you will be amazed because it's one of the most beautifully constructed airports on a hill and uh, this interesting case study of a reinforced retaining wall in uh, japan which is in kobe line uh, this was built in 1992 you see that it is a um, uh, segmental retaining wall with geo grids inside and the concrete panels outside it was built in 1992 and in 1995 there is a huge earthquake which is more than 7.5 magnitude on a moment magnitude scale you see that the all the structures surrounding this retaining wall were failed and then uh, the entire length of uh, this reinforced retaining wall 300 meters it is only slightly deformed during earthquake which is not even visible by uh, naked eye so this is standing uh, tall perfect an example for seismic resilience of reinforced soil structures and then in high speed uh, train corridors of japan because i am uh, talking about this is and this is our country's uh, dream this is our next most uh, important infrastructural uh, development in the country we will be uh, the present one ahmedabad to uh, mumbai express corridor uh, train project which uh, involves high speed trains where we need to build these reinforced retaining walls which have to sustain lot of uh, high speed train loads so this is in japan they have uh, used this geocentric reinforced retaining walls for abutments bridges culverts and tunnel protections the entire high speed corridor project of japan uses uh, you know um, geosynthetics completely continuously for all stretches and uh, this is another interesting case study of uh, wapi gujarat you know that in uh, wapi which is close to surat you have a uh, a uh, industry which is textile industry different types of chemical industries which produce large amount of toxic waste and the waste which is contained in the landfill uh, i mean it's uh, that this is a dump site once you dump this this can actually um, be very hazardous to environment and second thing is you can develop uh, dump only so much of a uh, dump because you, anything beyond that you would have seen a very um, i mean ghazi abad the uh, landslide in a dump waste dump it can actually be very uh, fatal so to dump more waste into this site and with a stable configuration they have extended vertical expansion of landfill was done so you can see the that there is a segmental um, modular block retaining wall is built 
to vertically expand a, a landfill. It is one of the very challenging projects uh, in the entire world. So they could do it and they have used geocentric reinforcement for this vertical expansion, which enabled about 2,60,000 meter cube of toxic waste. Originally, it was only 1,50,000 meter cube of waste. And this is in uh, one case study where I was involved in Belgium, Karnataka. There was a road which is completely damaged during rainy season. So the geo cells were used for uh, repairing this road. So once this is repaired, it is performing very uh, well and its maintenance also is not high. Every rainy season, it doesn't get damaged like it was getting damaged before. And uh, uh, another uh, interesting application is in the wind farms. You know that wind farms are uh, renewable sources of our energy for the next generation. And our country is also planning to have a lot of these wind farms because uh, they are extremely powerful in generating energy. In our country, particularly being coastal, we have large coast where we can harness on this wind energy which can be generated. So foundations for these wind farms can be uh, built using uh, lightweight geocentric materials, unlike heavy foundations. We call these as floating foundations for wind farms because they are made with uh, lightweight geocentric materials at the same time providing a high bearing capacity and high resistance to lateral pressures which are generated in these uh, windmills. And there is one failure case I want to discuss because geocentrics are not magic materials. Though they can provide resistance to a lot of uh, detrimental, uh, unstabilizing forces, they can be sometimes a failure in retaining walls. This is one uh, case study of a reinforced soil slope built to extend a runway of an airport, Agar Airport in Charleston, USA. This was um, actually a very challenging project and it also received the best uh, project in the decade award also. This was built by 10 k so the problem is once this is made, uh, this is built to perfection according to the design. Uh, using limit equilibrium methods, they have uh, used geosynthetics and built this. And this case study is available on net. Uh, some of you who are interested can go through this case study. And it is an excellent project. But uh, what happened is on one day, 2015, 12th March, there was a huge landslide which actually has uh, made this entire slope collapse, which was very, very, um, you know, very unfortunate. And you can see that this uh, entire reinforcing uh, layers are pulled off along with the slide, which is happening along this. So this design was OK. Reinforcement was fine. They have used simple limit equilibrium methods for the design of this slope. They could have been more uh, cautious. Uh, keeping in view of the, see, this is a huge landslide, which is a very deep seated landslide. So whatever reinforcement provided is not beneficial here because it was only protecting the outer layer of your slope. So when the, your failure surface is too deep and it is not accounted for in your design, it can be disastrous. You, the entire slope collapsed and um, it can be very dangerous. But I will uh, end my talk with a positive note, not with a failure. This is the world's largest human form, 400 meters long and 34 meters uh, height, which is sculpted using waste material from a um, carbon uh, coal mine, coal mine next to it. Huge um, coal residue waste is coming from this mine and then they do not know what to do with it. So this is in UK. What they have done is they have thought of making a wonderful park with a human figure made out of this waste material. They were able to make this. This is one of the most beautiful. This is called the North Lady or uh, Lady of Beauty of UK. So this is made. This is an aerial view. So you are not getting the exact dimensions of it, but it's a huge human form made with waste material reinforced with geosynthetics. This looks like, um, you know, this in aerial view. All these slopes are built using geosynthetics and waste material from the coal dump. And it is um, one of the very um, uh, attractive recreational spots in UK. You can see this case study also uh, from their uh, 10K website. Thank you so much. I'm open to any questions. Now I hand it over to organizers.
Uh, thank you, Professor Madhavi. It was really, really, I mean, very wonderful talk and uh, very informative in the sense that we got to know um, what is uh, geosynthetics material and, you know, and the potential of the, its, its various applications, where all it can be used. I mean, you, uh, you are so very exceptional in explaining and very wonderfully and very nicely. So thank you so much. In fact, I think it was uh, I mean, a very, very interesting talk. So now I'll, uh, you know, invite the questions from the, the participants. Maybe what you can do is, yeah, and a lot of appreciation is coming your way through the chat box, if you can scan through yourself as well. I mean, they're all appreciating your talk, I mean. So thank you so much, uh, all participants, for, you know, sharing your appreciation to the speaker. Uh, you know, I join you in whatever you are saying, it's super. So thank you so much. Uh, maybe uh, you can ask your questions directly also by unmuting yourself. And there are some questions there in the chat box also. Meanwhile, I'll scan through that. And in case somebody is willing to ask a question directly, so uh, you're welcome. Uh, one by one, maybe. Yes, who's that? Sir, this yes, is uh, Dr. Swati from the IT Sindri. Yeah, Dr. Swati, please ask your question. Yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, Ma'am, it was indeed a very informative lecture. Thank you so much for enlightening us with your precious knowledge. And uh, I just had a question that while making the landfill site, we go for the geo. So as to the combination of the ground groundwater with the leachate, could you please tell me what is the life of this geoliner used? And my second question is the cap material as well as the geoliner, is that the same? No, yeah, it's a good question. Uh, thank you, Swati, for that. So uh, as of now, like uh, to understand what is the lifetime of your liners, people have done a lot of centrifuge tests. Why they use centrifuge tests is, uh, see, uh, you can simulate 100 years in like few hours in a centrifuge. So from the centrifuge tests, uh, a lot of people from European countries, researchers have uh, shown that these liners are uh, can be very stable up to 50 years. That is the life period for the liners. And to your question, uh, second question, uh, capping and uh, liner, these are different materials. Because capping doesn't require any stability. It can, I mean, the liner which is at the bottom should be most permeable. So this is typically made with the GCL, which is called geosynthetic clay liner, where you have a woven geotextile, non-woven geotextile, sandwich, sandwiching a layer of bentonite clay. This is called GCL, which is available in market. Whereas for the capping, you don't need clay because you just want to, uh, this water not to percolate into the soil, uh, into the waste. So you use geomembrane. Typically it is a um, geomembrane. Sometimes you also use geosynthetic clay liner, but most of the projects use geomembrane. You can use the same one also because the uh, purpose is same, arresting the leakage. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Swati, and I hope you used and answered absolutely nicely. So thank you, uh, Professor Madhvi, for that. And uh, any other questions? There are there are some few questions, you know, uh, from uh, from Mitika Chauhan. So how the strength and porosity of geosynthetics changes under real application of law? That's one question. Uh, under real application of? Load, load. Yes, uh, this is also uh, an interesting question. Under load, geosynthetics can undergo fatigue and creep. Creep is one of the aspects because it's a polymer. Under sustained loads, geotextile or geo, uh, any geosynthetic material can creep. So there's a lot of research on how uh, the creep happens in geosynthetic materials. So it is uh, taken into designs because when you have this tensile strength of geosynthetic materials, you would have tested it under uh, controlled conditions uh, and then you apply a creep reduction factor. The tensile strength of uh, geosynthetic material is reduced by a factor which is called creep reduction factor. When you use this uh, in the design, you take care of creep. That is how they, uh, under the load, definitely it creeps and it will reduce. So the actual tensile strength of uh, geosynthetic material and the design strength will be different to take care of this creep and fatigue effects. Does Thank that you. Answer the I believe that you, the uh, Nitika Chauhan used an answer. And there's another question from Haron Lee. Uh, can we use polystyrene as geosynthetics? 
everything is a geocentric material i mean it depends on like what application it is like even see uh, some of my students in initial days used this ohp sheets overhead projector sheets laminating sheets we have built a geocell walls using our uh, uh, polythene sheets so geosynthetic material uh, you can actually make holes if you want drainage so uh, there is no reason why you can't call any material geocentric anything which can be used within the soil i have seen some studies where, where they have used plastic bottles uh, for reinforcing soils this is like uh, this is also a polymer which can be uh, only thing is you need to make sure that this doesn't react with soil and the um, materials which are like min, uh, composition of soil should be such that whatever material you are using should be inert should not react with soil as long as this condition is satisfied you can call any material as geosynthetic material you use jute okay. also cotton also you can use uh, coir fiber also as uh, geosynthetic material okay okay thank you so much sir madhvi and there's another question you know uh, could you tell just one second uh, okay could you tell the name of the software to study behavior of geosynthetics under seismic activity there are several software available in market and uh, some of them can be plaxis uh, flac geo studio uh, abacus these are the commercial software available uh, for seismic uh, studies on um, reinforced soil structures thank they come you, with, thank they you. come with a dynamic option you need to purchase the one with dynamic option to apply the seismic loads mm -hmm. thank you thank you professor madhvi uh, in fact and thank you everybody you know for your huge appreciation uh, of the, the this presentation uh, i can really say you know i'm absolutely wonderful appreciation coming from all the participants so thank you all very much uh, and maybe there was somebody asking a question uh, directly uh, i did hear some some voice yeah, in case yes, you willing you can ask yes who's that yes, identify yourself sir. and ask a question Yes, uh, yeah, ma'am. Uh, I'm Vidya Lasmi from uh, Itanagar. My institute is from uh, Neris. So, I, ma'am, actually, I would like to ask one question, like regarding the geosynthetic that was provided in the hills. That uh, later on, it can be uh, like the plantation we can do later on. So the plants were growing above the above the geosynthetic. So if there is heavy rainfall again, so because of the heavy weight again, is there any other chances that uh, like maybe sliding along with the plants? Uh... Yeah, uh, yeah, good question. So uh, what you are asking is like you have two forms of reinforcement. One is a, a geosynthetic layer on top of the slope, and then you have uh, vegetation inside. so is there a chance for the landslide even if you have these two types of reinforcement yes definitely there is a chance of a slide if it is a natural slope if you are just protecting your uh, slope uh, i mean geosynthetic on the top of the slope only protects it from erosion it only it also acts as a base for vegetation so your vegetation the, that is why i told you there is something called vatti wear we are being uh, using this uh, all around like our himalayan terrains these grow like i mean 2 to 3 meters long roots you can have that much stability if your slip surface is shallower than this the length of the root you can arrest failure but if it is beyond a deep seated failure you cannot stop it using uh, this uh, top geosynthetic cover and vegetation okay okay thank you ma'am thank you very thank you. much ma'am for that you thank need you. to go for rock anchors you need to anchor the existing slope using rock anchors Thank you, ma'am. Vidya, I hope you 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 got your answer. Thank you. Uh, and uh, there's one question from Dr. H. D. Chalaki. He's one of the coordinators also of this course from NIT Kurukshet. Dr. Chalaki, you can ask your question directly instead of through the chat box. You can unmute and ask a question. Uh, yeah. Hello. Yeah, we yeah, can hi. hear you. Uh, good morning, ma'am. Uh, my question is that, ma'am, what are the basic testing that is supposed to be carried out on the geosynthesis before using in a road or any structural uh, applications? 
yes that and entirely is a different lecture <laughs> that takes the three yeah, hours correct, for me correct. to tell but uh, definitely if you are using for reinforcement applications you need to test for its tensile strength and uh, installation damage puncture resistance grab tension and uh, even um, uh, uh, there are like sharp objects like uh, aggregates can push through it and damage it right so that kind of a thing and also geosynthetic layers you will be stitching because if your road is like few kilometers, you cannot just lay one layer, one roll of uh, geosynthetic is not enough. So you'll be stitching these layer, uh, rolls in between. So the stitch will not be as strong as the geosynthetic material. So you need to also test for the stitch which are using you are using in the road. So based on your application, for example, you're using for hydraulic conductivity, you need to do the permeability test for geosynthetics. If you're using for filtration purpose, you need to use a soil retention test. So there is this textbook called Designing with Geosynthetics by Robert M. Koerner, which is uh, considered as a Bible for uh, all geosynthetic related uh, concepts and testing. So you can refer to that book or even a lot of NPTEL videos are available which talk about this uh, geosynthetic testing. Ma'am, uh, another one information is needed because I have seen yeah. the uh, uh, slope stabilization work uh, for the Pune-Bombay highway. Uh, mm -hmm. They are using uh, uh, metals other than uh, uh, any uh, geosynthesis application to stabilize the slopes. Uh, why they are not use any use in this application instead of metal they use? Yeah, I mean, uh, see, some of the designs depend for very high uh, strength. Compared to geosynthetics, the tensile strength of uh, metal is definitely higher. So unfortunately, our codes do not talk much about geosynthetics. And that's what I was telling, like there is a kind of stigma in the entire, uh, you know, design process and execution process in our country. So only our designs, most of the times they depend on these companies. One is Reinforced Earth, which is a French company. So they will go for designs which are already available in codes. So that um, that is one of the reasons I can see for. In fact, this question I also have, why they are not adopting geosynthetics, which are much greener products compared to metals. But in the coming, uh, you know, railway corridor projects, which are like high-speed corridor projects, I am very uh, happy that the government has approached uh, people who are experts in geosynthetics, and they are looking for solutions involving geosynthetics. I think the the days are changing slowly and we are going to adopt geosynthetics more and more in the coming years thank you hello thank you, yeah, hello. Thank you so much yeah who's that uh sir myself ds makwana from bikan yeah, here please, please, yeah. uh, good morning madhu ma'am uh, yeah, you morning. provided much uh, valuable informative about geosynthetic simply just i want to know that uh, what type of synthetic material used for roof surface of home that's why we use as growing uh, organic farming which protect the ceiling or uh, design of construction thank you we use geo membranes for that because it has to be impermeable so what we use in these grow parts or grow uh, you know terrace farming kind of things are typically geo membranes yeah Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Madhavi. Thank you, Dr. Sharma. I think, you know, we have queries in that sense, they're very, very interactive. And uh, there's a, this one question, maybe that's the, the last question we can take up before we close the session. Uh, what are the government policies about use of geosynthetics in road construction? There's a question, madam. From yeah. Policy. Yeah. So I told you, like, uh, we have this entering into courts in recent times. Indian Roads Congress is very, very, uh, you know, uh, active in this uh, particular direction. They want geosynthetics to be involved in the construction. So in the present uh, IRC courts, we see that usage of geosynthetics is, uh, you know, the advantages are clearly outlined and also is um, recommended usage of geosynthetics. But most of the IS courts do not talk about this. So we all are working towards that, including the uh, geosynthetics companies and engineers and all experts uh, want to bring geosynthetics into full-fledged designs in our country. So that is yet to happen. Thank you, Professor Madhavi. In fact, you know, I mean, you handled all the queries so nicely and you know, responded to, to the questions you know and so effectively so thank you so much and thank you all the participants in fact you know for being there with us in the session and you know sharing 
your appreciation being so generous in fact and whatever you've been feeling even you know been sharing through your chat box so thank you so much and you know, for being such a wonderful audience and uh, thank you professor madhvi you know for such an amazing talk uh, we are really very happy with and we got to learn so many so many things that we were not knowing earlier uh, so uh, over to uh, over to professor jakhad you know for uh, concluding uh, this session and maybe more thanks to professor jakhad thank you thank you sir thank you on behalf of organizer thank you so much madam uh, for your very nice and very informative and very uh, excellent uh, session and i think all participants had uh, enjoyed uh, the, uh, your session and uh, very the session is very interactive and very useful and uh, you have very nicely explained the ge geosynthetic applications in constructions and uh, you have shown various case studies various application in various part of the our country as well as world so it's a very nice thank you so much madam for sparing your valuable time and accepting our invitation thank you so much and thanks to all participants for your nice interaction and patience thank you over to professor sat thank you thanks a lot very informative lecture ma'am thank, thank you everyone thank you everyone for your patience thank you. Yeah. yeah thank you dr madhvi i mean you closed on a success story and you know so many beautiful examples instead of a failure that was really interesting you know that you didn't want to close on a failure you want to close on, on a success story <laughs> so thank you and i'll share a document with your email do the needful and send it back to us right sure thank you so, thank you all thank you so very thank much you, we meet thank in the next session thank, thank you, you thank you now you can end the thank session here Yeah. Yes, uh, sir. Some of participants want to know about the attendance and the feedback, sir. Uh, feedback uh, will share at the end of the program, the last day. The feedback form, wherein you can share the feedback about every session and maybe about your experience on the whole and all. And attendance we are catching through this uh, Webex platform only on our own. So you don't have to worry about. You just have to regularly attending the sessions, and uh, you know there's no separate link to be shared. the attendance part who is logging at what time and for how much duration everything is you know maintained in this webex report so we'll take that attendance part from the uh, this uh, you know webex uh, platform only so you know we get to know you know who logged in and for how much time somebody logged out logged in you know everything is there as a record with us so we'll take care of that from this and uh, you just have to take care of one thing that you are regular regulars in attendance sessions and i'm sure you know uh, you know we have put in efforts to connect a uh, really very you know I mean, speakers in their domain you know, what the authority is with you and i'm sure in every session will be a learning for you really really you know really very good speakers may be fortunate to to get the kind consent of so uh, just be regular uh, be be fine and cheerful and stay in all sessions if you can that's what we'll expect you uh, but you know in case if not all that we stay in most of the sessions so that's what i'll make a request so that's what it is so thank you all i think ravi that's done Yes, sir. yes, sir. thank you, sir. Okay, uh, thank you, Madam uh, Madhu. In case you are still connected, now we are like closing this session. Thank you. All. Okay, sir. Thank you all, and now we are end the meeting, sir. Yeah. Now you can end. The meeting.